Okay, so what I want to talk about today is using video games to reverse engineer human intelligence. Uh, and this is a work um, in collaboration with a bunch of people, uh, particularly Pedro Tsevitas, who was un until recently a, a postdoc at MIT. Um, so let me start with a seductive hypothesis, which I'm sure all of you have heard before. So on the one hand, we have deep learning systems that are vaguely brain-like, right? And then those same systems can achieve human level performance on, on various tasks like uh, image recognition. Um, so if we put these two things together, it's seductive to think that we might have a recipe for human intelligence. And, and of course, um, that idea has not been lost on, on a number of people and corporations. Um, so is that really true? Uh, and I, what I wanna do is focus on Atari since that was one of the early big wins uh, for deep learning. And that particularly this 2015 DeepMind paper. Um, and as I'm sure all of you know, right, this was the, the origin of this uh, deep Q learning network, the DQN, uh, which is basically in ComNet that um, controls a, a joystick uh, and maps from pixels to joystick actions. Um, and this is from the original paper. Since then, I, they, they've pushed the barrier down much further so that I, basically, I think we know how to play Atari games successfully at, at least human level performance um, with deep learning systems, kind of like this, but you know, there are very, a lot of different variations of this idea. Um, but I'll, I'll try to clarify in a moment um, what exactly is meant by play video games, because this is a crucial point, uh, play them like humans, right? So really what we're talking about here is we can achieve hu um, human level scores or exceed human level scores with some amount of training, which remains unspecified. Okay, so is this how humans learn? Um, and I wanna focus on two properties of, of human intelligence and human learning in particular, that we can rapidly learn from few examples and then we can generalize flexibly. And the argument here is that these properties are not yet fully captured by deep learning systems. That doesn't mean that they can't be captured, but we have to think carefully about, first of all, um, understanding empirically, what is it that, that humans are actually doing Right, characterizing the, the behavior, uh, and then thinking about um, the information processing capabilities that uh, enable that, um, that performance. Okay, so it, it's, it's instructive here to focus on what a DQN does really well and what the DQN doesn't do so well with. Um, so the kinds of games that the DQN does really well with are things like Breakout and Stargunner. These are games that are kind of fast paced and require a lot of sensory motor coordination, but not particularly challenging in terms of uh, a kind of conceptual or analysis of the problem or, or, or um, some kind of long range planning. Um, whereas down here, games like Frostbite and Montezuma's Revenge um, are really hard to do, to, to, to do successfully um, without understanding something about how the game works. Um, and, and when I say do successfully, I don't mean just that if you give the network enough training, it will eventually solve the, the problems, um, but rather that, um, that you could give it the amount of training that humans need uh, to solve the problem. All right, so, so let me just familiarize you for a second with, with Frostbite, and, and I'll refer to what we call the Frostbite Challenge. Um, with, so, the, so Here's Frostbite Bailey, he's, he's jumping on these ice flows uh, to build this igloo. And meanwhile, he's trying to avoid these birds. Um, and once he's built the igloo, he can hop back up there and go through the hole, uh, go through the entrance rather. And on later levels, you, there are other um, things that come into play like other kinds of animals and so on. Um, so the Frostbite challenge is the following. So the, it consists of three stages, one is reaching basic human level performance. The second is, can we reach human level performance as quickly as people do? And the third is, can we perform new tasks or goals with little or no retraining? And the argument here is that really what deep learning has been successful at at this point um, is reaching basic human level performance. And in this sense, it's kind of ironic that the cover of nature, um, the issue where th this, paper was, was um, published had uh, the words learning curve on the cover because arguably the learning curve is actually the least compelling part of this whole demonstration. And, and this is all due credit to the amazing accomplishment of this network, right? But I just wanna um, 
be clear about what is what is the nature of success here. Right? It's about asymptotic performance, not about sample complexity. Right. So here's human level performance up here, roughly speaking, um, and here's uh, DQN's performance on frostbite um, after you know 800 plus hours of gameplay. Now, how fast do humans actually get to this level of performance? Well, basically that fast, right? It's it's so fast that at the scale of uh, hundreds of hours, it, it looks like just a blip. Um, and you can get better sample complexity using other variations of um, DQNs. Um, you know, some things get kind of tantalizingly close. And of course, this is a little bit outdated. Um, so there, there are algorithms that are even better than this. And, and we've compared to, to some of them. Um, now, if we zoom in here, like even this op tightening algorithm, which does pretty well, um, we're still really um, looking at sample complexity that, that's much slower than humans. Now, uh, hopefully you guys have all ascertained a, a weakness in this sort of argument, right? Which is, which is commonly brought up when we compare human and machine sample complexity, which is that um, the DQN and, and all deep learning systems are basically trained from scratch on a, on a single game. So it has to learn its entire visual system and, and everything else, its value functions and so on uh, from training, right? On this game. And we're counting that in the amount of experience. Whereas humans come into the game with not just their own developmental history, but also you know, however many millions of years of evolutionary history behind them um, that have shaped their visual system and their, their um, uh, inductive biases about value functions and so on, right? So um, there's an alternative hypothesis, which is that actually humans are not learning faster than, um, than the DQN or its variants, but rather that um, they're just at a different point on the on the same learning curve. Um, so, so how do we compare with this argument that they're basically on the same learning curve, but, but just different points? Um, that would be a kind of deflationary argument. Uh, and the, what we've done to, to study this is um, computed what we call the performance matched uh, learning rate. Uh, and the way this works is uh, you pick a performance level. Uh, uh, human, let's say a human performance level. Um, and then you find the point on the machine's uh, learning curve at which they've achieved the same performance level. And you look at the slope of the learning curve at that point, right? So if they're on the same learning curve, assuming this learning curve is monotonic, then um, the slopes should be the same. Does that make sense to everybody? Right, so, so by matching for performance, we're, we're checking whether they're on the same learning curve. Um, so here's here are the, the the slopes for a bunch of different games for both humans and and DQ. And these are these are experiments that we ran, um, and notice that this is the learning rate. This is the slope of the learning curve at different performance levels, um, uh, and this is in, on a log scale, right? So we're looking at really orders of magnitude differences in humans. And humans are always learning much faster than uh, in this case the double DQN, uh, and the story doesn't really change significantly if you look at other learning architectures. And by the way, please jump in if you have any questions or, or comments. All right, I'll keep going. All right, so what does this mean? What, what are actually humans doing that's ostensibly different? Um, and the argument I wanna make is that from the very beginning of play, people see objects, agents, and physics. Um, they actively explore. Um, object relational goals. Um, and then eventually they come up with multi-step plans that exploit what they have learned. Um, so, so here in playing Frostbite, they first have to figure out sort of what, what is there on the screen and then exploring what happens when you interact with different objects. You eventually figure out that you're building an igloo. You later have obstacles on different levels. Um, like there's a polar bear and so on. Um, and I'll come back to a more specific story about what we think humans are doing in a, in a moment. Let me, let me just give you a little bit more data. This is not meant to be a really comprehensive series of studies about how people play Atari, but it will give you a, a sense of what, um, what kind of constraints we need to place on a learning system. So um, here's an example of one shot or few shot learning about harmful actions and outcomes. So if you collide with a bird, um, that's a bad event for the, for, uh, the agent. And um, you can see that 
the agent only has to collide with the bird maybe zero or, or you know, really at most three times, usually less, um, in order to never collide with the, the agent, um, with the, um, the bird again, right? So it's really just takes a few interactions with the bird uh, to learn to avoid it. And, and I wanna point out that um, this already tells you something about the kind of object oriented nature of representations that we think people have, because how do you specifically avoid a bird if you don't have a representation of a bird, right? You need to have something in your learning system that represents bird um, so that you can learn specifically about it. Um, now, I, you might I, ask, can I, sorry, is it coming? Question, yeah. Clarification question. That, yeah. When you said agent bird collisions, they, that was human players. Is this? Yes, this is human yeah. players. Yeah. Yeah, so if you, if you run a DQN on this, it will definitely not look like this at all. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and I'll show you some data on this later. Yeah. Okay. Um, now, now you might say, well, humans actually have a bunch of extra knowledge about what's going on here. They have, they know about igloos and ice flows and birds and so on. Now, putting aside for a second, uh, the fact that the way that birds and igloos work in frostbite is quite different from how they work in the real world. Uh, and many people don't really have firsthand experience with igloos or bears. Um, we could ask, all right, well, what happens if we try to, to eliminate that source of knowledge? So what we can do is just blur the screen, right? Um, and that really doesn't make any difference to learning curves. Okay, so um, the, the last little data point that I wanna show you is um, learning from observation. So if you watch an expert player, like, well, like we watched that video just now, notice that the agent never interacted with the birds, right? So we have no data about no explicit data about what happens when you interact with birds. But if you notice that, if you know that there's an expert player moving around and they never contact birds, that's not a coincidence, right? The, you, the, the player must know something about birds, namely that they're bad and you don't want to collide with them, right? So that's learning from negative evidence. You know, much like when we learn language, there, there's lots of, there, there's an infinite number of ungrammatical sentences that nobody ever says, but we learn that one shouldn't say those um, ungrammatical sentences. Um, and if you, if you give people a little bit of observation, just two minutes about observing an expert player, um, they can use that knowledge to accelerate their learning. Um, and that's shown here. So, um, uh, and, and you can see this also, if you compare um, the, the, this few shot or one shot learning um, between just playing by yourself versus playing by yourself plus watching an expert for two minutes, you can see that now the modal number of agent bird collisions in the first episode is zero, right? So now people have successfully learned that you shouldn't interact with birds um, and they employ that knowledge. So now it's essentially zero shot learning after some observation. Um, but we, we did a, uh, also a kind of a funny experiment where we basically ask, what happens if we just show them the instructions for frostbite? Can they learn from, from verbal instructions? Now, in some sense, this has to be true, right? Um, uh, and, and indeed it is true. Um, but just think about what this means for DQN agents, right? Like most model-free reinforcement agents, or even most model-based reinforcement learning agents don't know how to read, right? They don't know how to interpret uh, an instruction manual. Um, so the fact that we can actually use that uh, to aid our planning says something about the, the nature of representations. Like if you had, um, in order to understand these kinds of instructions, minimally you need some kind of relational object-oriented representation of the game, right? Because the instructions are relational and object-oriented. They tell you, you know, what happens when you collide with a particular agent, for example. Okay, so this just summarizes the basic results. Uh, blurring doesn't affect your performance, but instruction and observation improve your performance. Okay, um, so what about performing new tasks or goals with little or no retraining? And here I'm just going to appeal to a kind of thought experiment. Um, so let's imagine some, some goals, alternative goals that I could give you after playing Frostbite. Get the lowest possible score or get closest to 100 or 300 or 1,000 or 3,000 or any level without going over. Or beat your friend who's playing next to you, but just barely, not by too much, so as not to embarrass them. Uh, go as long as you can without dying. Die as quickly as you can. Pass each level at the last possible minute right before the temperature timer hits zero and you die. Uh, and you can keep going. You can, you can invent 
hold a ton of these kinds of um, alternative goals. And the conjecture here is that people can do these alternative goals. They can play a version of frostbite uh, where the game itself is unchanged, but the goal is different uh, with relatively little training that, that we can somehow transfer um, our knowledge from one game to another um, when just the goals have changed. And that's quite different from most model free agents where the, um, the value function is basically, and, and hence the goals are basically baked into the um, parameters of the network. All right, so I've given you some motivation for why we need to think a little bit differently about um, how human solve these kinds of reinforced learning tasks. Um, and then, and now I wanna take more seriously the question of how we would actually build agents that learn in human-like ways. Um, so, so the argument at a high level is that humans don't just do pattern recognition and function approximation. They're learning something like a theory of the game. And these theories support rapid learning, efficient planning, and flexible generalization. So the perspective um, that I'm trying to argue in favor of here is what we call theory-based reinforced learning. You could think of it as a kind of model-based reinforced learning, but where there's fairly strong constraints on the nature of those models. Um, and we've built a specific agent that um, embodies these principles. Um, and I should say that it's more of a modeling framework because th there are various aspects of this that we are trying to improve and make more scalable and so on, right? So um, th there are lots of ways that you could actually instantiate these ideas. Um, and consists of basically three steps. So one is a perception step that's going from pixels to symbolic description. And the results that I'm going to show you, we've mostly just been operating on the symbolic description and we're actively working on the perception step. Um, then from these symbolic descriptions, we need to do some kind of theory induction uh, to learn basically the rules of the game. Um, and then the theory is used for planning and exploration. And here we use a kind of Monte Carlo tree search where the theory provides a simulator. And then we have exploration bonuses that are, that are object oriented and relational. So, so we can say things like, I don't know what happens when I collide with that crab. So I'm gonna go and try it out and see what happens. I'm gonna add an exploration bonus for that event. Uh, and for our theory language, we've used a kind of lightweight um, language for video games that was developed by Tom Shaw. I think basically as a weekend project. Um, it's called the Video Game Description Language or VGDL. And um, he, here's what it consists of. So um, there's a sprite set. So those are the different sprites in the game. Um, there's uh, a level mapping that, that tells you um, what the different levels are. Each level has a corresponding map. Um, there's an interaction set. This is really kind of the crucial body of the theory. So what happens when you interact with different agents? Or, or different agents interact with each other or, or different objects interact with each other. And then termination said, these are the termination conditions. Um, so we can actually render these games and make them playable. They look like this. Um, you know, we, we can have fancier graphics, but um, for, our, for the purposes of our human experiments, we wanted to strip away all the semantics that would be familiar to people and just have colored squares. Um, so let me give you a sense of how this theory-based reinforcement learning works um, with a bit uh, richer set of graphics. So um, let me just orient you here. So here's the app, here's the avatar. And um, these, uh, these white boxes with question marks on them uh, indicate things that the agent doesn't really know much about and wants to learn more about. The, the pink arrows show the agent's in, uh, current understanding of the game dynamics, um, so the interaction set. Um, and then these yellow uh, arrows show possible plans that the agent is considering. So initially, the agent maybe knows a little bit about um, the direction of travel of these um, cars, um, but it still needs to, to learn about some of them. And it really has no clue what's going on over here with these logs on the river or what this, this thing is. Um, now, by mid-stage, it learns that, all right, if I interact with these cars, I'm going to die. So I want to go around them. Now I need to learn about water and logs. Um, I've also learned something about the dynamics of these logs. Um, and then eventually I learned that, okay, I wanna avoid the water and jump over the logs and then get, figure out what this thing is, which turns out to be a goal. Um, and one of the cool things that you can do with this is generalize it to other environments where you may have overlap with some of the previous 
sets of objects. So you still have water and logs and so on. Um, and so you could you could use that knowledge to chart a path to the goal, but you may also want to figure out what this thing is over here uh, and interact with it. Um, let me show you some examples of games uh, that we've had people play. So this is a game where um, an agent wins by making all blue disappear by pushing blue into yellow. Um, and then you can you can kind of ratchet up the complexity. So now touching red uh, turns red into yellow. Um, and um, and now in this third iteration, pushing orange into purple makes orange disappear and turns purple into yellow. So you basically have to learn a whole chain of, of relations in order to win the game um, and so on, right? Um, so this is what the model looks like when it plays this game. So the, the thing I wanna draw your attention to is that the model is is not trying lots of random actions. It's specifically interacting with objects and pushing blocks into each other um, to, to see what happens, right? So that's a, that's a critical aspect of how the, the model plays the game. Um, here's humans playing the game. And you can see that that um, there, there's a lot of similarities here, right? The agent, the, the human is pushing the blocks around, interacting with them, seeing what happens when you push one block into another until it figures out that, um, what it needs to do. So the agent um, is not seeing the actual pixel observations. It's seeing the actual, uh, it's seeing the symbolic state representation. That's right. Yeah, for now, for now at least, right? We hope to eventually solve that problem. Actually, it, it's not that hard to solve that problem for these kinds of games, but it's what, what we've, we've been trying to solve it for the harder problem of Atari games, where Atari games can't, many of them can't even be literally described in, um, in a VGDL formalism. So we're, we're one of the things that we've been trying to establish is like how robust is this framework um, to violations of the modeling assumptions. Um, so we've been, and then also of course, trying to apply to cases where we don't have those symbolic descriptions available and we have to infer them from, um, from pixels. Atari turns out to be kind of a nightmare because I don't know how many of you guys have worked on Atari, but uh, like this is less of an issue for like a DQN type agent, um, but, but, but for these kinds of agents, there's all sorts of weird quirks with Atari, like, like partial occlusion kind of uh, randomly, like, 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 like when you, like, I forget which game it is where you can push a paddle down and it gets, eventually gets partially occluded for, for no apparent reason. Um, but that totally screws up a, a system like EMPA because now it's like, uh, it, it doesn't, it, the, the visual system we've equipped it with doesn't understand about occlusion, right? So, so essentially the, it, it forces us to solve various problems that are kind of auxiliary to the things that we're really trying to focus on, um, like solving occlusion. Um, and that, yeah. that's basically what we're struggling with now. I guess if you have like a memory, more of a memory component, then you, you might be able to yeah, so there's all sorts of hacks that you could do to basically make it more robust. Um, and that's sort of what we're, we're doing now. But, um, you know, the, you know, one hack makes one thing work and breaks some other things. So it's it really ends up being a bit, um, you know, unfortunately complex. I guess on, on that topic, yeah. of trying mm -hmm. to solve this perception mm -hmm. of the problem. Do you think, do you think I mean, I guess you must think this if you're doing research, but do you think at some point you'll be able to kind of solve that to a, a satisfactory level or, and like, it, what's the, I don't know, what's the upside of, if you, even if you can solve it for Atari games, you'll probably go through a lot of pain as you already described yeah. and probably more. And then, and then for some new environment, it's probably going to be a whole new type of pain. Yeah, that's right. And, what how do you think about so i think i think, I think this point this point i mean this problem is sort of as old as you know the 1956 dartmouth summer school right where everyone thought that they just assign um vision as a problem to the grad students to, to uh for the summer um and i guess that methodologically the issue here is um how do you make progress on certain aspects of the problem without having to solve all the other problems um, mm -hmm. of intelligence. Um, 
because it, it's our it's our feeling that the the successes of of confnets and things like them are often kind of um, successes of working with like like what's so great about them is that they can operate on on low level sensory data and eventually learn something useful right um, but the problem is, is that in doing so, in the particular way that they solve those problems, they don't acquire the kinds of representations that allow them to, um, to generalize flexibly and, and learn quickly the way that humans do. Um, because they, they basically their inductive bias is much too weak or they don't have the right sorts of inductive biases. Um, and this is not going to be something that will be solved with like putting, you know, <laughs> Gaussian priors on the weights and things like that, right? It's a structured inductive bias that people have. Um, so the question here is like, is there a way that we can carve out um, a problem where we can study the kind of more conceptual issues in human learning, right? Like learning the rules of the game, if that's indeed what people are doing without having to solve all the problems of, of vision. And I, and I think we, we have made problem, we, we've made, we've certainly made progress on that problem um, if we just operate on on symbolic description. So if you accept the premise that something in the visual system provides symbolic descriptions of scenes, and I think you can make that argument for the human visual system, um, then, then we've made progress on that question, right? But, but it still remains unsolved how in a very generic way to go from the sensory data to some kind of symbolic description. And I, I guess you're assuming access to at least at least when you do this initial, you know, uh, uh, tackling this initial version of the perception to symbolic mm -hmm. formulation, um, you're also, I guess, it's it's more like a grounding problem because you're also, are you like also assuming that there's an existing sort of like um, bank of relations that you just need to ground to, or are you also um, learning the actual like binary operators for in first order logic? like the propositions are you also learning the propositions from scratch yeah so well you have to yeah I'm, I'm assuming that there's some library of relations and objects and you're basically learning about what happens like which which relation um which relations apply to which particular um objects got it so now of course i it's important that we allow we um we, we have a system eventually that can extend that library and, and that that's another yep. place in which I, th I think that that's a kind of a more straightforward extension of what we've done here right but we, we, what I'm showing you now we, we're, we're we're not assuming it like like I, I think we can kind of all agree right that when we look at a picture like this you know you see you, you it's pretty straightforward like what is where right like there's a bunch of of um colored squares and you know where they are, right? That's not the hard problem, right? And, and, and also you, you can easily recognize when one object has collided with another object, right? So there's some basic uh, primitive spatial relations which are just obvious to us, right? But what requires learning and what's a subtle, you know, which is a much subtler learning problem is to actually learn the, the, the structure of those rules, right? And that, that's, that's much easier for a system that has explicit um, uh, relational representations defined over objects compared to like a system that is just a, a like a feed forward neural network yeah I, I guess like in situations where you have more complex games where you need where it's not just like binary proposition propositions but it might require you know like n area where n is really large like you might have like 12 dozen conditions that have like a dozen conditions that have to be satisfied for a particular result then that might be really hard i mean that would be really hard for a system like this to learn well, can you give me an example of what you're thinking of? Um, I guess one would just be like, if you think of civilization type games, like mm -hmm. a tech tree, and then like, I guess, without specific access to the tech tree map that the game gives you, like that would be yeah. a type of situation like that, where I can only build this factory if I've built this entire tree of previous dependencies. Right. Um... Right, so I guess one one way to approach that is to say that there's some background state, but of course you don't want to. 
you don't want to basically try to build a giant lookup table, right? In that case. Um, so yeah, I think that you're right, that that raises some interesting challenges here. I, I think that actually, I'm going to come back at the end and, and say how I think deep learning can actually be useful as a useful kind of um, adjunct to the kind of framework that I'm describing um, to, to precisely to solve these kinds of problems. All right, so, so here, let me just show you the learning curves here. Uh, this is actually a case where the, the model um, uh, learns quite a bit faster than humans. Uh, I'll show you some other examples where, where humans learn about the same or if not faster than the model. Um, here's, a, here's a game where the agent has to pick up all the uh, pink boxes to win uh, and the chaser, which is green, tries to pick up the yellow box, which is a termination condition. And there's this purple fence that the agent can go through and the yellow uh, can be pushed through that the chaser can't pass. And so, so the agent can learn to take advantage of this. Um, so let me show you what this looks like. Okay. So here, right, the, the chaser got the yellow thing. So now this time he's a little bit smarter. He pushes it all the way to the pink. Um, right, he can do that again under a different circumstance. All right, here it gets a little bit harder because now there's more pink squares. Oh, he was a little bit too slow that time, but if he can get it the next time. Okay, now here it gets really hard, right? How on earth is he supposed to solve this one? Okay, uh, and the answer is that if he tries to do it that way, it's just not gonna work. But eventually he figures out that what you need to do is push it into the fence. So now the, the chaser is trying to get through the fence, but he can't, and he's basically stuck there. And you can just go and, and collect all the pink boxes. Um, so this is an example where the model and human learning curves look quite similar. Um, we've built 90 different games um, generated using VGDL and compared it, uh, compared it to a variant of the DQN. Um, compared to to the DQN. Uh, and you can see overall, um, EMPA is doing much better than DQN and also um, much closer to what humans are actually doing, which is this dash line. Um, here are the learning curves. So you can see that sometimes humans are doing uh, a bit better than, than EMPA. Sometimes they're about the same. Um, but in, in every case, like the DQN is basically not doing well at all, basically flat for a lot of these learning curves. Um, another informative thing we can look at are these object interactions. So I've divided them here into uh, positive, neutral, and negative interactions. Uh, right, so the bird interaction frostbite, frostbite would be an example of negative interaction. You can see that both EMPA and humans, um, almost all of their interactions are with positive objects, positively valenced objects. Whereas uh, DQN, it's not like it's, it's interacting a lot with negative objects, it's just spending the vast majority of its time interacting with neutral objects, like you know, just bumping into walls, right? So that's another kind of qualitative way in which these models are different. Um, another th thing you can look at is a kind of learning to learn measure where um, the, the, uh, we look at the number of steps it takes to win level two conditional on having one level one. Um, and you can see that both humans and EMPA take very few steps to win the second level after having won uh, the first level, whereas DQN, if it gets to level two at all, takes quite a lot longer to win level two. But you know, even more tellingly, it often just doesn't get to level two at all. Um, another interesting qualitative feature of the data has to do with exploration. So if you look at the patterns of exploration in humans, and you could, you could see this also in the, the, the videos that I showed you before, um, the patterns of human exploration are very um, object-oriented and selective, right? So, so these are, this is a heat map of the different paths that the human agents took. And you can see that um, they really just zoom in on, the, on, on particular objects that they need to learn about and don't interact at all with the other objects. Um, and then in a second level, which is shown on the right here, um, they, they really select to go for a single object that they need to learn about. Um, and EMPA does something qualitatively similar. Whereas if you look at the DQN, um, this is what I was talking about before with just bumping into walls a lot. You can see the heat map is super diffuse. They, they're just kind of wandering around a lot, right? Um, and, and we attribute that largely to the fact that the DDQN isn't object oriented and relational. And so it has no way of kind of guiding its exploration towards um, specific objects or relations. 
Okay, so to, to take stock of what I've shown you, uh, I, a theory-based RL agent can play games in human-like ways. So that means not just asymptotically, but the same performance. Um, um, you know, like, like they're actually playing it in a similar way, right? Not, not if we have to kind of go beyond just looking at score metrics in order to gain this insight. Uh, and, and I've argued that object-oriented relational representation is key combined with a theory induction algorithm for sample efficient learning. Um, so what is the model in model-based reinforcement learning? Um, this is actually kind of more for psychologists and neuroscientists who have spent a lot of time studying model-based reinforcement learning, including myself, but often in very simple tasks where we could um, represent it in a kind of tabular form. So a lot of our understanding of model-based reinforcement learning in the brain comes from these fairly simplistic tabular assumptions. Um, and what, what we're trying to do now is kind of go beyond that and look at more theory-based representations that are non-tabular, uh, that have more structure. Okay, so what about deep learning? Um, I actually think that deep learning will be critical to making these kinds of approaches scalable, which currently they basically aren't. Um, so every step in, the, in that architecture that I showed you could benefit from the pattern recognition and function approximation abilities of deep learning systems. For example, learning fast pixel to symbol mappings, um, finding good theories quickly using neural program search, um, using neural value function, uh, um, value approximations as heuristics to guide planning, like in AlphaGo. Um, so I think all, the, all these things can and should be explored. Um, so to wrap up, um, I've argued that human video game learning should be better thought as theory building as opposed to a kind of pattern recognition and by using theory induction methods in a, in a simple but rich description language for games we can do better um, compared to current state of the art systems but there's still much work to be done uh, with that I'll stop here, thank you. <laughs>